Okay, so I'm going to start out uh, with a case to talk about um, how I'm incorporating some age-adjusted alignment. I want to thank Nick Clark, one of our uh, all-star fellows, uh, who um, put these uh, this case together. Um, but basically, it's a 67-year-old who um, presented with um, 13 uh, uh, scoliosis ever since the age of 13. It's progressively been worsening. Uh, she also had some intermittent left side left lower extremity symptoms uh, uh, with uh, leg pain without any significant neurologic deficits. Um, she's um, otherwise neurologically intact, um, relatively benign exam here. And here are standing um, AP and lateral x-rays uh, demonstrating a 72 degree um, thoracolumbar curve, thoracic curve of 65, um, slight imbalance to the left um, and mild thoracolumbar kyphosis. Here are left and right bending x-rays. And uh, here's the MRI, which basically demonstrates um, the uh, extent of left-sided neuroforaminal stenosis. Obviously, this uh, MRI is performed in the supine position. So you could imagine how when she's standing, uh, the extent of foraminal stenosis there that you could see at 4.5 and 5.1 is probably worsened. I think 4.5 is worse than the 5.1 level. Uh, here's a subsequent uh, CAT, uh, CAT scan. Uh, that demonstrates um, some relevant anatomy in regards to her uh, uh, pedicle size and the extent of spondylosis, but uh, otherwise uh, nothing very uh, pertinent here. So we diagnosed her with adult idiopathic scoliosis, mild uh, to moderate uh, left-sided L45 and 5.1 for aminal stenosis. I would say moderate to severe 4.5, moderate, uh, mild to moderate at L5-S1. So uh, just a couple of discussion points for a case like this is obviously um, what's the operative approach? Um, if you do osteotomies, what levels are you gonna address? How proximal would you extend the construct and what's your final goal of the correction? For the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on here. I think Chevy gave me a little nudge saying I need to move a little faster. So with respect to that, uh, we decided to do a T3 to pelvis type operation. Um, and uh, this is really a typical case uh, uh, that we do for these uh, type of operations. We gave her about two and a half liters of crystalloid. Uh, it's about a four hour surgery, four and a half hour surgery, um, and uh, just about a liter of blood loss. So here's a intraoperative uh, films that we obtained. And um, you could see here the intercrestal line. Um, you know, obviously the film is not taken perfectly orthogonal, but uh, the, as far as 90 degrees up from the crest, uh, her balance is good in the coronal plane. And her sagittal plane looks good too. So, you know, I think three or four years ago, I would have said, okay, great. Um, I'm happy with this. Let's start closing. And, uh, uh, you know, given the fact that her pelvic incidence is about 47, even though the lumbar lordosis here looks like it's elevated at around 64, I probably would have said, you know what, I got a great correction and I'm going to start closing this case. But actually, I was not happy with that uh, because I thought her lumbar lordosis was a little too overcorrected. And this is something that typically happens when the left-sided rod is introduced for these patients with adult spinal deformity, because after the right-sided rod is placed and you translate L4 over to horizontalize L4, and you start uh, engaging the rest of the uh, tulips on the right side, you then start to place the left-sided rod. And the left-sided rod, when you're starting to engage the L3, L2, and L1 fixation points, especially in these patients with a mild amount of thracolumbar kyphosis, you start to cantilever bend down uh, to achieve uh, the correction and the persuasion. And that generates lordosis in the upper parts of the lumbar spine. Um, and I think that's a move that a lot of people uh, utilize when they do the rod persuasion and it results in uh, this overcorrection. So what I did, um, what I ended up doing here is, uh, you could see here, that's the first uh, intraoperative film where I had 64 degrees of lordosis. I actually took that left-sided rod down, and instead of doing the cantilever bending, I actually gave a little bit of kyphosis so that there is no cantilever bending on the upper parts of the lumbar spine for the rod persuasion on the left, and it allowed me to um, have this uh, correction. So post-operative, so about, about 12 degrees less of lumbar lordosis intraoperatively. So these are our final um, post-op standing uh, AP and lateral x-rays. Pelvic incidence, the lumbar lordosis is relatively matched. You can see that the, um, uh, there's no evidence of PJK in the, at the upper end of the construct. Uh, but I thought this was an interesting case because this is probably something I would have never done uh, four years ago with that intraoperative film. I would have accepted the correction 
and I would have closed the patient up. And the patient probably would have translated that extra 14 de degrees of lordosis that I would have given her to the upper part of the construct and probably would have developed PJK. So this is the paper that uh, really was one of the first ones. Uh, there was also a paper that came out from WashU in 2015 that did not address age-adjusted alignment, but was talking about reducing the amount of correction as far as your lumbar lordosis and your SVA. There's another example of a patient uh, where this was exercised. This patient had a unique deformity, severe um, thoracolumbar kyphosis with a compensatory hyperlordosis. And in this patient, um, trying to replicate this contour is one of the trickiest things uh, uh, that you could try to address in the, in the, in the operating room. Uh, but the way that we did this was we introduced a left-sided rod, distracted, and you could see here the difference in the lordosis initially that I got, which was 61, and I thought it was a little too high given our pelvic incidence. And we came off on it uh, by introducing a, some distraction to reduce this hyperlordosis initially in the sequence of the reduction down to around a low 50s, 50 degrees of lumbar lordosis there intraoperatively. Um, and you can see the post-op alignment appropriate and I think uh, better age matched. And uh, again, no evidence of PJK at this point. And I think an example of how I probably would not have done that. I probably would have said this correction is adequate and left the operating room probably about three or four years ago. So I will show you a case from three to four years ago where that actually happened. So this was a 55-year-old who had back pain and leg pain. I did a T10 to pelvis on the patient, uh, got an excellent correction intraoperatively. Um, but if I really look at the lumbar lordosis intraoperatively, very critically, 74, her pelvic incidence is actually around uh, 65. So my thought, um, if I was doing this case today, I probably would have came off on the correction a touch and actually try to give her maybe about 55 or 50, uh, or uh, 60 degrees of lordosis instead of uh, the 72 that I have here. And you could see what happened to her. Uh, and these are some of the parameters that we use as far as the cutoffs. Um, so somebody, somebody that's 40 to 65, 65 and above, um, I'll go through that in my conclusion side, but this is what happened to this patient. So this is the acute post-op x-ray. You can see, see the, bo bone, uh, the bone graft here, but um, no evidence of PJK, still pretty lordotic. The patient is very happy. She's now three years post-op, but you can see what happened through time. So this is her two-year post-op x-ray um, the, on, the, on the lateral. So no real PJK. Um, she still has the 73 deg degrees of lordosis, but what happened now that she's three years post-op is she started to develop this little bit of a PJK here at 24 degrees. Asymptomatic, doesn't need a revision surgery, is probably going to be fine. But I think one case where uh, not applying the age-adjusted alignment parameters uh, resulted in, in this uh, junctional issue. So in conclusion, I think I'm, I'm really being strict in utilizing some of these age-adjusted parameters. For anybody less than 45, I try to match the PI to the LL. Um, anybody 45 to 60, I try to undercorrect by 5 to 10 degrees in regards to the pelvic incidence, the lumbar lordosis mismatch. And anybody over 60, I try to undercorrect under by even more, 10 to 15 degrees. And it's very important to understand that although I gave these um, uh, cutoffs in regards to age, it's really a spectrum. So it's not like a, a, a nominal variable. It's, it's really just a, a, a spectrum in which I consider these patients. Somebody who's 70, I might correct uh, to 17 or 18 degrees of undercorrection, for example. So that's all I have to share for today. Thanks.